Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of Learning with Human Kinetics. My name is Aaron and today I'm going to talk about periodization. Now periodization is important to the progression of nearly any strength and conditioning program, uh, whether it is for a competitive athlete or someone simply looking to stay fit and athletic uh, for activities of daily living. I understand this topic has many viewpoints and as is the case with many topics within the strength and conditioning and fitness world, but the intent of this discussion will be to explain the basics and benefits of using periodization model so that it is a little easier to understand. Now, by many accounts, the first experiment with periodization of strength training was organized leading up to the 1964 Tokyo Olympics. The results produced a gold medalist. Seeing the success of the program, uh, the results were then shared in Moscow in 1965. That concept was then altered in 1968 uh, to suit the needs of endurance sports for the sake of muscular endurance. According to uh, current professor, author, and former National Strength and Conditioning Association Board of Directors, President Greg Half, part of the confusion with periodization is that many people define it differently. Half defines it as the logical integration and sequencing of training factors into mutually dependent periods of time designed to optimize specific physiological, psychological, and performance outcomes at predetermined points. The NSCA similarly says that periodization refers to the logical phasic manipulation of training factors to optimize specific training outcomes at specific time points. It is the systematic process of planned variations in a resistance training program over a training cycle. Notice a few things there. It is the systematic process of planned variations in resistance training. Also, both definitions point to the goal uh, of a process being to optimize outcomes at predetermined points. Essentially, periodization is a plan. It's a roadmap to guide you in the training process so that you can peak at a certain time. The primary goals of periodization are to manipulate the volume and intensity of the workouts by changing the exercises performed, as well as number of sets and reps in a particular session. A research indicates that training this way will promote training adaptations and reduce the risk of overtraining because of the variation the athlete experiences, uh, both physically and mentally. Think of periodization as a roadmap, like I said, to help you get to your goals. It's a blueprint. You will then use your programming to organize the components of training that will help you get to those goals. The primary form of periodization I'll be talking about today refers to linear periodization. There's another form of periodization that I'll discuss later called undulating periodization, where training sessions are divided into heavy, moderate, and light training days uh, throughout the week. I'll tell you more about that approach later and what type of client might benefit most from that form of periodization. Now, before I dive into it too deeply, uh, it is important to understand that periodization isn't only for athletes and can be used across the board from athletic to general populations. The type and specific approach to periodization might look different depending on the specific goals. Now, regardless of the specific goal, periodization is generally divided into cycles and phases uh, to simplify, you can think of these cycles as a calendar. The first cycle is a macro cycle. Now, just like the name indicates, uh, this is the largest division of cycles and typically constitutes an entire training year. Some people might call this their annual training plan. In the case of an Olympic athlete, uh, the macro cycle might last up to four years. Thinking about the calendar analogy, uh, this would be the entire year or the calendar. Think of this as an entire training program from the end of a season uh, to the following season. Let's take the example of a high school basketball athlete. They'll begin their competitive season around November and finish up around March. So that athlete's uh, macro cycle would include everything he or she is doing to prepare for the next season from March when the season ends through the off season, uh, preseason prep and in season training during the following season. Taking this approach, the macro cycle would consist of everything within that training program for the entire year. In the example of the Olympic athlete, the macro cycle would be the entire four year window of prep for the Olympics all the way through the competition phase of the Olympic games. The macro cycle typically is comprised of two or more mesocycles. 
Now, a mesocycle is divided into several weeks or up to a few months. In general terms, uh, for the calendar analogy, think of a mesocycle as a month, one month. Uh, this can be extended, for example, if the athlete needs more time in one phase. Now, the number of mesocycles and uh, the duration of each depends on the goal of the athlete. Uh, the amount of time available to train within that mac macro cycle and the number of sport competitions contained within a specific period. The current model for American uh, strength and power sports was developed in 1981 and is, mod is a modified version of the program created by the Soviet Union and Eastern European countries. If you're a trainer, a coach, or have been an avid lifter, these standard mesocycles will sound familiar. And they are hypertrophy, strength, strength and power, and a competition or peaking phase. Now, each mesocycle is divided into microcycles, which can last anywhere from one week uh, to four weeks, again, depending on the length of the macro cycle or annual plan and the length of the mesocycles. Now, in the hypertrophy phase, uh, the goal is to develop a muscular or metabolic base to help prepare for future phases. This phase will include higher reps for each set or a plan devised uh, not only to increase muscle mass, but prep uh, for the strength phase. Generally, the hypertrophy phase will last anywhere between two and four weeks with a rep range of more than six reps per set. Typically, uh, this might be in the range of eight to 12 reps uh, per set for three to five sets. Now, if you're looking for percentages and like to train that way, you are looking at less than 85% of your one rep max. Now, rest breaks can range anywhere from 60 to 90 seconds uh, between sets. In the strength phase, reps will decrease uh, with the goal of increasing overall strength and maximizing muscle force. Like the hypertrophy phase, the strength phase will generally last between two and four weeks with rep ranges of up to six reps uh, for three to five sets. Notice this is up to six reps with the idea that with fewer reps, the af athlete or individual will be able to lift heavier weights to help increase overall strength. In this same line of thinking, uh, the weight should be at or above 85% of your one rep max. Now rest breaks for training uh, strength are generally between three to five minutes between sets. As the athlete continues to progress in his or her training, uh, the program should advance to a strength and power phase. Now, this is one of my favorite phases because it's a mix of continuing to build overall strength while beginning to add more dynamic and powerful movements uh, to help the athlete get more explosive. The goal is to increase the speed of force development and power with low volume, high intensity exercises. This is also where exercises can begin to get a little more uh, sport specific, whether that is specific to the explosive movements uh, being done or the energy systems development being used. Again, this phase typically lasts between two and four weeks, though it could be lengthened depending on the sports season or specific training goals. Now, like the strength phase, or like the strength only phase, I should say, sets are gonna be between three and five uh, per exercise with one to six reps per set um, about, at about 85 to 95% of the one rep max. Longer rest breaks are recommended for the phase uh, to get adequate recovery. Now, following the power phase uh, is the competition phase where the goal shifts to attaining peak strength and power going into the season. In this phase, loads are increased, allowing for only one to three reps at about 93% or more of the one rep max. But if you're choosing a power exercise, uh, you will want to stick with the lighter weights, relatively speaking, that you use during the strength and power phase for those power movements. Don't forget any type of speed and agility component that uh, you need to add during uh, programming. And these can be specific to the sport the athlete is getting ready to compete in. For example, if the athlete is prepping for tennis season, uh, you might use more lateral agility movements in addition to sprinting and of course, deceleration. Having said that, an argument can be made that those tendencies should be trained year round. And if we're doing our jobs as coaches, uh, we'll give the individual what they need to improve for overall performance. If the athlete is fast but not strong, the programming should include more strength. If the athlete is really strong but not as explosive, then the focus should lead more towards power development. Now the active phase will come after the competition phase um, and that can be used for multiple reasons. Um, 
it could be used following competition or peak phase. Uh, like I said, just prior to the beginning of the season, it can be used as a deload phase in the middle of your periodization schedule. If the athlete is beginning to you know, get too fatigued because of an intense schedule and it can be used at the conclusion of the season, just prior to going into the hypertrophy phase. In the active rest phase, uh, the goal is to allow physio physiological and mental recovery through low volume and low intensity training, or even activities that uh, might be completely unrelated to the sport. A good example of this is a couple years back, I was training a couple of tennis athletes who trained year round and had a really intense lesson and tournament schedule. Now, occasionally we would take a mental and physical break uh, from the regular training and we took a football outside to play catch. Now, they ran routes and uh, played out game type scenarios just for the fun of it. They had never played uh, organized football in their life and they were single sport athletes devoting their time to tennis. Uh, but for them, it was fun and gave them a mental break and a physical break from the movements they were doing daily on the court. Now, like I mentioned, uh, the active rest phase can also be used as a deload period for uh, one to three weeks following the competition phase just prior to the competitive season. There are a number of schools of thought surrounding this, uh, so sometimes a case-by-case -case analysis is needed. Now, generally, uh, the cycle can then be repeated beginning uh, again with the hypertrophy phase and progressing through the competition phase. There are cases, though, where this might not be the best approach. Now, if an athlete is a multi-sport athlete um, and in season, uh, it might not be beneficial to return to a hypertrophy phase, uh, but rather leave or have an extended strength and power co or competition phase uh, to help the athlete maintain strength throughout the season. Now, this is a great example of where I suggested a mesocycle could be extended. Continually cycling through the five phases uh, also might not be beneficial to the particular athlete if he or she has specific needs that should be addressed. For example, if the primary focus of the athlete is to gain strength, it would be more beneficial for the uh, program to spend more time in the strength or strength and power phases rather than spending unnecessary time in the hypertrophy phase. On the other hand, if the athlete uh, needs to add weight or muscle mass, the hypertrophy phase could be extended prior to moving into the strength phase. Now, it should be also noted that uh, while the phase durations that I mentioned earlier are recommendations, it would be mostly inappropriate to cycle through all five phases, phases within a 12-week span. That would be very fast uh, unless you had a condensed time span that you were working under. Instead, the trainer or coach should tailor the program to the specific needs of the athlete and also have the phases coincide with the athlete's sports season. A good example of this would be a national level tennis athlete that I trained. Uh, tennis is a unique sport from the start, not only in the movements, but in there really is no downtime. Now, this particular athlete played her regular high school season in the fall, but also traveled all over the country for national level tournaments throughout the year. Uh, in this case, I was careful to make sure she was always ready for her high school season, uh, but perhaps more importantly for her, I altered her periodization so that she was prepared for her biggest national level tournaments. Another way to think about uh, the training cycles uh, would be to map out the length of time leading up to the next sports season and plan backward from that point um, so that you know when the athlete is wanting to peak. For example, if the athlete season begins in August, you know that just prior to that athlete's first competitive match or game, they should be working through their competition or peaking phase. You can then plan backwards based on the athlete's specific needs going all the way back to, to the conclusion of the previous competitive season. This will give the athlete uh, the training and preparation they need while making sure to stay on track for their off-season plan. Now, I previously mentioned microcycles. Um, now, the term microcycle is rooted in the Greek word micros, which means small, and the Latin word cyclus, which refers to uh, a regular sequence of events. Now, by general terms, a microcycle is a weekly training program within the mesocycle and macrocycle. In the calendar analogy, this would be one week within the month of the mesocycle. It's structured according to the objectives, uh, volume, intensity, and methods that are focused, uh, or that are the focus of the training phase. So for example, if the athlete is working through a strength phase of the mesocycle, the objective during the micro cycle will be strength. That means that regardless of the number of sessions during the week, 
each training session will be focused on strength training and the appropriate uh, range of sets and reps. Now, where this could be altered is when using undulated periodization. The option, uh, this option would be good for multi-sport or year-round athletes as well. Now, to be fair, general populations are also good candidates uh, for this style of training. An undulating uh, periodization model varies training during the week. So instead of spending four weeks in a hypertrophy phase before moving on to strength, for example, you would alternate during the week. Um, an example of a three day per week undulated uh, periodization schedule might look like, uh, say, day one, you have a heavy day for strength with three to four sets of each exercise at three to six reps each. Uh, day two might be a light day focusing more on hypertrophy or muscular endurance, depending on your specific goals. And day three would be a power day uh, focusing on high movement velocities at about 70 percent of your one rep max. Now, if the athlete is training more than three days per week, this uh, the fun part is getting creative with the programming during the week. So maybe have one strength day, one hypertrophy day, one power and speed day, and one day for active recovery. Um, undulating periodization would also be great a great option for sports with extended seasons like tennis or hockey or uh, maybe college or pro basketball. Now, typically during the season, training volume is reduced and is based on the amount of practice or game time the athlete is getting. For example, if an athlete has uh, intense practices during the week in addition to games, they probably aren't going to do excessive, if any at all, conditioning during their training sessions. Uh, you might choose the important lifts uh, for that day or week, uh, give them plenty of rest in between sets, and make sure they aren't getting too fatigued. It's important to remember that athletes are training so that they can compete in their sport. Uh, the goal is to make sure they're ready for game day. And if they get too tired or become too sore from training, they're losing out on the intent of training in the first place. So just as undulating periodization uh, can be utilized to train athletes in season, it's a great way to train general population clients who, or those who uh, don't have a specific competition-based goal. Uh, use the case of an adult uh, who is no longer participating in a competitive sport, but wants to train to stay athletic or maintain their fitness. An undulating periodization plan would help them train from multiple pr perspectives throughout the week, rather than spending long blocks of time in one uh, particular phase. So like the earlier examples I gave, uh, this training plan for two days per week might consist of uh, a heavy or low rep strength day for day one, um, day two might be higher reps to work on either hypertrophy or muscular endurance, um, depending on what the overall goals are with both days working in power components as well as conditioning. Now, if the client is training three days per week, uh, the workouts can be split up a little more with day one being a strength day with low reps, uh, day two moving to higher reps, and day three uh, moving toward more of a power focus. So one question in understanding periodization might be why. Uh, why is this way of training so effective? The effectiveness of periodization or periodized programs is attributed to the systematic variation that allows the athlete to recover from phase to phase. So following a hypertrophy phase, the athlete begins to work towards strength. Uh, and in that sense, it gets a break from the relative uh, higher number of reps uh, from the hypertrophy phase. The same goes for strength. Following the strength phase, the athlete then moves on to a power phase where uh, they can use all that strength that they built to gain more power heading into their competitive season. So you can see how shifting from phase to phase or between mesocycles, the athlete is gonna have enough variation to make adaptations and also not get mentally burned out by doing the same type of workout year round. We know what happens uh, most often when an athlete gets mentally or physically burned out. Um, they either get injured or they end up quitting. So periodizing a training plan uh, helps reduce the risk of injury to the athlete while also avoiding burnout. Uh, speaking of that, the sports industry is a $17 billion industry in the United States alone. Um, part of that is within the youth sports industry. In the United States, youth sports participation is nearly 30 million, uh, but the rate of attrition is at 70%. So put into uh, perspective, consider a freshman class of basketball athletes having maybe say 10 participants. Uh, by the time they are juniors or seniors, 
um, a tradition which suggests that uh, there would only be three remaining members from the group. Now, reasons for dropout uh, are becoming more common. Uh, one is that they simply aren't having fun playing anymore. One of the leading reasons for lack of fun is the pressure they feel from uh, too much emphasis placed on winning. Many of them quit because of physical discomfort or suffering too many injuries. Now, according to Stanford Children's Health, in 2019 alone, 775,000 athletes aged 14 and younger were treated in hospitals. That was a 78% increase from 2016. In 2017, the NCAA reported 45,000 injuries and also reported that 65.6% .6 of the injuries occurred in lower limbs. Uh, so things like ankle sprains, ACL tears, meniscus tears, and hamstring strains. Now, while injuries can't be pre uh, prevented 100% of the time, they can be reduced. And a great way to assist with that is uh, periodized strength and training, uh, strength and conditioning program. With a periodized program, the athletes will use proper progressions uh, to make sure they're strong, athletic, and powerful uh, in time for their seasons without burning out. Now, regardless of your individual goals, uh, there are benefits to both linear and undulating periodization models. Uh, the task is in finding the correct progressions within each of them in terms of reps and sets and determining how long to stay in each phase or mesocycle within your plan. You can use a periodized program and still give the individual the specific uh, training stimulus they need. If the individual needs uh, more hypertrophy work, spend more time in that specific mesocycle. If they need to be more powerful, make sure they have a solid strength base uh, and then spend more time in their power phase or mesocycle. A 2004 study by Ray and Alderman explained that uh, periodization significantly improves performance compared to non-periodization models uh, for strength and power. Now, periodization al allows the body to adapt to stressors uh, placed on it while continually progressing to improve strength and power. Some might argue that periodization doesn't allow uh, for enough variation, but at the same time, too much variation will result in the individual having a reduced ad uh, adaptive capacity. Um, it is suggested that fewer training targets will allow the individual to have more adaptation in the long run uh, leading to further progress toward the ultimate goal. So whether you are an athlete or non-athlete, uh, a long-term uh, development plan will lead to the best results for most people and will establish long-lasting habits for long-term fitness, health, and wellness. Uh, for more information on periodization and its benefits, um, you can look into resources like the NSCA's Essentials of Personal Training, um, NSCA's Guide to Program Design, uh, periodization of uh, strength training for sports, and periodization theory and uh, methodology of training. So I hope this helped explain the concept of periodization and answer questions you may have. Um, until next time, have a great workout. <laughs>